48 hours. We take you there. This man has been stalking a child on the internet. What is that smile saying you want to make love? Now he's expecting to meet a 13-year-old girl for sex. She'll be in the gazebo. Peter Van Sant investigates. Are you a virgin? Unbelievable. Can these cops right. stop an online predator before it's too late? He's here. And she was a popular student, murdered for no apparent reason. Amy never knew it was coming. But her killer had declared his intentions online. And he actually tells us in advance how this murder is going to happen. Susan yeah. Spencer reports. How long was this website out there? Approximately two and a half years. So why didn't anyone stop him? Plus... Here's Mike. Catherine checked into the background of her online match. I'm looking for whether or not he's lying to me. But there's a catch. I think it's an invasion of privacy, frankly. And should Beth have investigated the man she met on the net? Bill Lagatuta has the story. He just threw me down in the bed and he started strangling me. A 48 Hours Reader's Digest joint investigation. It's loaded. Of course it is. How far do you have to go to protect yourself from a cyber stalker? Dan Rather, and this is 48 Hours. It's a world of wonder and endless possibilities. Cyberspace, a high-tech frontier with no boundaries and few rules. Good evening. When you go online these days, you've got lots of company, including millions of strangers, people you probably wouldn't let into your home, except you do. Because online, even the most dangerous predators can virtually come right in. It's estimated tens of thousands of Americans have already been victims of stalking on the Internet, repeated harassment and threats. What's more, the FBI calls the sexual exploitation of children online one of the most significant crime problems they and we as a nation are facing. Tonight, in a joint investigation with Reader's Digest, We'll show you the threat, plus how to protect yourself and your family against a cyber stalker. Peter Van Sant begins in some of the darkest corners of cyberspace, where innocence can be easily lost. How many of you have gone into chat rooms on the internet? Every day, millions of kids are spending time in internet chat rooms, talking to total strangers. I feel it's like a thrill, and it's kind of like making new friends in a way. I mean, it's just somebody else sitting at a computer. I mean, there's not that fear of somebody being right next to you and everything. You really don't think to yourself that they're going to meet you or anything, so you really don't care. But what children don't realize is that every minute they spend in a chat room, they are being hunted. Back it all. By men like this. Ray Knopp. He's a sexual predator who calls himself Dr. Evil. Hey, Ray, how could you send such obscene material to what you thought was a 13-year-old? Knopp was arrested after traveling to Virginia, expecting to have sex with a 13-year-old girl, a girl he met and seduced Welcome. on the Internet. Investigators believe there could be hundreds of thousands of predators like Dr. Evil searching the net for victims. This used to be a favorite place for sexual predators to stalk their prey. Today, they stalk a virtual playground, the Internet, where millions of children visit every day. But now, law enforcement is fighting back. Ready on the right. Fire line is ready. Sheriff's deputies Jamie Watson and Mike Harmony Shooters be alert. are taking dead aim at Internet predators. Fire! But not with guns. Their weapon is a computer. Their beat, Internet chat rooms. Here's two right here. X11, X12, X13. People who are interested in 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15-year-olds. And if you go in between the X's, K-I-D-S, F-U-K, 7, 12, those are the type of rooms that, that people create and then go into. When we're online in an undercover capacity, we will pose as anything. We'll pose as children, either sex. Went on as a 12-year-old as a female. We will pose as adults. We will pose as people who are interested in, in trading child pornography. Watson and Harmony are part of Operation Blue Ridge Thunder, 
the most successful program in the country fighting internet crimes against children. Anytime, day or night, you can find this crap. This guy's asked me about having sex. You don't know how much I want to meet you and make love to you. If we can pull that one person off the street and we can put that person in prison, then I feel there's children out there that are going to be safe or safer. Ah, uh, I see where this is going. He's going to do the whole take your clothes off thing. Mm -hmm. We're not here to entrap people. We're not here to, to be big brother and watch everybody that's on the internet. What we are here to do is protect the children. Good girl. He just talked to me like I was a dog. I can't wait to have fun with you. These cyber cops don't work in New York or Los Angeles. Their headquarters is in the shadow of the Blue Ridge Mountains, tiny Bedford County, Virginia. We're described as a sleepy little town, and we are in the thick of this sort of investigation. And I, I said, we, we need to do something. We've got to do something, as small as it may be. Mike Brown, sheriff of Bedford County, created this task force in 1998 after a local girl was targeted by an Internet predator. We can stay on the Internet 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and communicate with people that we know are surfing the, the web for children. Including Dr. Evil, who didn't know that the 13-year-old girl he was emailing was in fact a 21-year-old Blue Ridge Thunder officer. She asked us not to show her face. This was definitely the worst case that any of us as investigators have ever seen. What did he want to do with this 13-year-old girl? He was going to teach her some of the most crude and horrible things you could ever imagine. The worst you can imagine times two or three. Oh, times 100. Dr. Evil may have had more than just sex on his mind, in his car, police found an axe handle and a knife. You got a smile on your face. Are you proud of what you did? So do you believe that in the case of Dr. Evil that you may have stopped a murder? I, I don't think it's any question in my mind. We, we stopped one. Knup has been sentenced to three years in prison, but the task force's work is far from over. For a pedophile, this is, this is paradise, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's their playground. If I am online as a, as a 12, 13-year-old boy or girl, if I go into a chat room without saying a word, within one or two minutes, it's nothing for me to have 15, 16 people, well over 18, trying to talk to me. We asked Inspector Watson to take us online, posing as a young girl. This girl's name is Tina. She's 13 years old. She's from Virginia. She likes to ride horses and ice skate. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is go to find a chat. Once we enter a chat room... Love way young girls. There's one. All we have to do is wait a few seconds. He just contacted me. And he asked if I like older guys. Yeah. Every time we hear that tone, what does that mean? It means somebody's sending me another message. Listen to this. They'll come up faster than I can answer them. You like older men? How much do you weigh? What are your measurements? That was quick. You have sex? Immediately, they start talking about sex. People believe that you're a 13-year-old girl, and the ding-ding of this with all these people wanting to make contact with you, and this has all happened in a matter of minutes. Parents have the misnomer that if their child is in their living room, they're perfectly safe. Listen to all the chimes. What they don't understand is their child is in their living room on their computer. They can be giving out their home address. They can be talking to somebody who has every intention of taking the child away from mom and dad. Are you a virgin? Ever have sex over the phone? If we meet, will you do me? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. It is. I, I swear, I wish I could reach through the screen and, and lay hands on these people. Now, Watson may soon get a chance to do just that. He's been online undercover for more than two months. <laughs> you raging pervert. Communicating with this man. I just sent him a smiley face. Let him read into that what he will. Is that smile saying you want to make love? The task force identified him from his America Online account. Oh, AOL it, fax came in. Oh, good. That's the address. As 45-year-old Timothy Farnham a school bus driver from Albany, New York. He asked where I wanted us to make love for the first time. He understands full well my supposed age as a 13-year-old. That's probably what scares me the most, is that he is full aware 
that what he is doing is wrong. Oh. How would you like to meet at that spot? He's here. Now, Bye. Farnham wants to meet face to face. We were talking about meeting in just a matter of hours. If I were a real 13-year-old child, I would be in incredible danger at this point. Danger because they say the suspect is what experts call a traveler. What is a traveler? Traveler is our nickname for somebody that wants to travel whatever distance, 20 miles, 2,000 miles, to have sex with a juvenile. That's what this guy is. His intentions right now are to travel down to, uh, to pick up what he believes is a 13-year-old female to take back with him out of state. But for this suspected traveler, Bedford County may be the end of the road. Everybody ready? Everybody. Of course, we were in a vest. Our intentions right now are when he comes down to meet our decoy, take him down. We've got a couple felony charges that we'll place against him. 1.30. Leave in a minute. Next, the task force investigation moves into its most dangerous phase. You guys are going to have shotguns for the takedown. Yep. Saddle up. He's asked if, uh, if we could have sex in the car when he gets here, and I told him no. For Bedford County Sheriff's deputies Jamie Watson. It's all going to come together. And Mike Harmony of Operation Blue Ridge Thunder. Think he's nervous right now? Probably. <laughs> We're on the edge of a cliff. <laughs> Two months of undercover work are literally on the line. My problem now is I really like to get some information from him as to where he is and what he's doing. And there's no really good way that I can ask that without sounding um, that sounded like a cop. Don't back I'm off. Not, yeah. Their suspected sexual predator, school bus driver Timothy Farnham, is looking for a first date. Ha! <laughs> ha! Oh, there is a god. I can come down and meet you at 3 p.m. Farnham is ready to travel almost 600 miles from his home near Albany, New York, to the small town of Bedford, Virginia, to pick up what he thinks is the young girl of his dreams. The very last thing he said was, I do want to make love to you so much. Would you at least kiss me on the way home? This is somebody that needs to be introduced into the judicial system. A new day in Bedford County. All right, Mike and I and Tim will be in the van um, parked in the, the center parking lot there. so we And the Blue Ridge Thunder Task Force is preparing a rude awakening for their visitor from up north. Sarah, of course, will be acting as the decoy. She'll be in the gazebo. If she has any kind of trouble, she's going to pull her hat off. She pulls her hat off. That's a trouble signal, and everybody just get there as fast as you can. This is your bulletproof vest? Yes. Once again, this 21-year-old undercover investigator Pepper spray. will be on the front line to meet the suspect. Ready to rock and roll. While this officer is playing the role of a victim, we've got a guy that we're working a case on. The task force never forgets that there are real victims. Do you ever think to yourself, I could be dead now? Yeah. Like 16-year-old Diana Strickland from Opelika, Alabama. How easy is it to meet one of these men? It's real easy. I'm Diana was 15 when she started an internet friendship with Larry Stackhouse a 43-year-old man living outside Philadelphia. What was the nature of your conversations back and forth? Well, at first, it was just, hey, how you doing? What's up? You know, just basic conversation like I would have with any of my friends. And then it gradually got sexual. Did it ever even occur to you that somehow your daughter could get in some sort of trouble by just communicating on the internet? No. Diana's parents, Mike and really Teresa Strickland, know say she was never much trouble. We thought she was talking with a couple of her friends. We didn't know it, that she had been talking with an older man. One month into her online relationship with Stackhouse, Diana disappeared. She didn't come home from school, and uh, nobody knew where she was. I don't think we ate or slept for four days. I, I felt like I was going to move heaven and earth to get her home. But I didn't know if she would ever be back. Stackhouse had driven more than 800 miles to pick up Diana and a friend at this parking lot for what they thought would be an adventure. He lived in a big city, and he said that we could come home whenever we wanted to. He would buy us what we wanted, and he just, he offered us 
he, he basically offered us the world. He drove them back to Philadelphia, where he kept them locked in his apartment, held captive for three days. Did he sexually assault you? Yeah. Diana's friend eventually got to a phone and called for help. Police moved in and Stackhouse was arrested. He's now imprisoned in Pennsylvania and the Stricklands are keeping a much closer eye on Diana's internet activities. I shudder to think what he could have done to her. We're very lucky that we, we found her when we did. <laughs> Mother. <laughs> I mean, she could have been another statistic. She could have been dead. How often do you invite strangers into your home? Never. And yet one came in, didn't you? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Just walked right in. Everybody ready? Back in Bedford County. Everybody got your badge? It's zero hour for the Blue Ridge Thunder Task Force. Everybody, of course, will be wearing a vest. Radio frequency will be special one. 1.30, leave in a minute. You guys are going to have shotguns for the takedown. Yeah, saddle up. 50 to 5, you copy? 5 to 50, contact. He's going to be driving the description that he gave me as a 93 Red Eagle Vision. They're hoping their suspect, Timothy Farnham, is in the neighborhood. Our location's over to the right. And they're setting up a stakeout at a small park just outside of town. Straight down below yep. there is the gazebo that the decoy is going to be fixed in. See you later, girl. See you later. As the decoy moves into place, give me a uh, signal six if you don't mind. The team waits for their target. Set on the rail. Okay. Now let's get comfy. All right now, everybody, shut up. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. what kind of car is that right there? And why is it stopped? We've got a burgundy van uh, stopped on the side of the road up towards that Exxon station. If you can just check it out a little bit. 51 copy. I'll take a ride up there and take a look at it. Again, we got a small red vehicle behind McDonald's. 54, can you see the vehicle still? The cars. Looks like he's slowing down there for a little bit. And the hours. Just checking back in. Nothing new. Pass by. You've been waiting for two and a half hours now, sitting here. But there's no sign of Farna. We've got a no show as of this time right now. No sky angle call. Until. It's an explorer. Stopping. He's just stopped there. He's looking Stop too. Right. He's looking around. He is looking hard. Shit. Look at him looking over the gazebo. OK. Just a second. But it turns out to be. OK. Disregard, this is a false easy. alarm. Five, you copy. They've got bags of uh, food. Come to feed the ducks. We got to get them out. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Cars pulling up. See, God, there's another group. We've got uh, two cars full of people and children feeding the ducks. If you could get them to move. Temple. We have got more duck feeding people in Bedford County than I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> As darkness falls, we've been out here for about four hours now. It's clear they've been stood up. <sighs> May have got cold feet. Ready to wrap it up? I do believe so. We'll get his ass another day. Are you disappointed? To a point, just because I wanted to, I wanted to have this wrapped up. There's another day, another time. Later on 48 hours, sooner or later, he's going to get caught. The Blue Ridge Thunder Task Force gets another shot at their man. His life will change today. If she had any idea or any fear of somebody, you know, like just the feeling that somebody was following her or stalking her, any fear whatsoever, she would have told us. Nearly every Friday. These are some of my daughter's friends. On this side street in Nashua, New Hampshire, Amy Boyer's friends mother and stepfather, brother and little sister, gather at the scene of her murder. She used to work right around the corner over here. To remember. And Amy never knew it was coming. It was late afternoon. And he waited for her to get in her car and then drove up beside her. Amy had just left her job at the dentist's office. And called her name so that she would look up. When 21-year-old Liam Yowens made his move. Put his gun out the window and put it against her window and destroyed her. Seconds later, Liam Yowens shot and killed himself. 
Not a minute goes by that I don't think of her. I, I can't sleep. I just, Amy's mother, I just Helen, and stepfather, it. Tim, say their beloved 20-year-old daughter was happy, successful, with everything to live for. I still can't believe it. And her parents say Amy had no idea who Liam Yowens even was. It was the most confusing part of the investigation, drawing a correlation between the shooter and the victim. Nashua Police Detective Sergeant Don Campbell. Why did he shoot her? What, what is his association with her? The answer was hidden behind the locked doors of Liam Yowen's bedroom. What we found on his computer was a website that he had constructed entitled Amy Boyer. Liam had no job, spent hours in his room, lived with his mother, and rarely spoke even to her. But he poured his soul into amyboyer.com. When we clicked into the website, what we saw there was a detailed chronicle of how he had stalked her for years, how he felt about her, and how much he wanted to kill her. On the website, Yowens explained how he'd fallen in love with Amy in eighth grade, how they'd gone to the same high school. She rejected him, he wrote, and he decided right then she must die. He, he actually tells us in advance how this murder is going to happen. And the way he chronicles it in his web page is exactly the way he carried it out on October 15th. When did you first find out that these web pages even existed? The night of the murder, the police called us to the station. It's like, my God, he wrote about this on the, on the World Wide Web, and no one is responsible for looking at this? At times, Liam had two websites about Amy, both perfectly legal. How long was this website out there? It said uh, approximately two and a half years. The companies that yanked them right after the shooting say they have policies against such sites, but no resources to monitor content. Only after the murder did they know what Liam was up to. And, and that's where some know. of the anger comes from, is that, well, the company that he created this on certainly should have known. I'm of the opinion that if we were able to be made aware of this information, that this crime would not have occurred. And Yowens had other uses for the web, again, all legal. He bought the information he needed to track Amy down online. Her social security number, the name of her employer, her work address. You don't let them sell someone's personal identification number for a buck. Her stepfather wants all that stopped. Why, why do they get to sell all of our personal information for their personal gain? Amy Boyer's death here in New Hampshire has sent her parents on a crusade to stop cyberstalking. But even in the 30 states that have laws against it, victims say they often feel helpless. Our joint investigation with Reader's Digest into the dark side of the web found that laws, always hard to enforce, are virtually meaningless when stalkers are across state lines. I'm going to show my secret pocket now. This actually drove you to get a gun? It drove me to get a gun for myself. We don't always have Writer Jane Hitchcock remembers what it's like to be scared to death. Once all this began to happen to me I, and I began to feel really unsafe, I decided I'd rather have something to protect me, learn how to use it and use it well. It is loaded, so. It's loaded? Of course it is. Jane's stalkers targeted her four years ago after she tipped authorities to a scam running on the internet. She got it shut down, but not before her mailbox was bombarded and insults emailed to her employer under her name. And that wasn't all. It escalated to all sorts of other things, including putting my name, my home address, and my home phone number on the web, saying that I was available for sex any time of the day or night. Her stalkers finally were caught, and Jane says her nightmare led her to start a website for other stalking victims. We get over 100 people a week emailing for help because they're being bothered in chat rooms, through email, news groups, mailing lists, message boards, you name it. If we can create the system, we can monitor it. And in March of 2000, Amy's parents, Tim and Helen, testified before a Senate committee to argue for new internet privacy laws. And I just feel that some reasonable cause for our safety should be taken. I don't believe that our social security numbers should be for sale. But for now, the laws seem stacked in the stalker's favor, as Amy Boyer's parents know only too well. These are some when she was little. They learned it was illegal for them to use their own daughter's name on a website in her memory. The name was already registered. 
If you were to go in there and put in www.amyboyer.com, you know who owns that? The young man. The young man, Liam Yowant, Amy Boyer's killer. He owns the domain name. As he's in the ground, he owns the name amyboyer.com. Going after an internet stalker, as we've seen, poses unique problems for law enforcement. Currently, federal authorities can only intervene if a cyber stalker travels across state lines. Unfortunately, an online predator can spread fear from a great distance away without crossing those lines. As with stalking behavior in general, the perpetrators on the internet are mostly male and the victims overwhelmingly female. Even though complaints about cyber stalking continue to rise, a lot of people seem willing to take a chance on a little cyber romance. But how do you keep an attraction that begins online from getting out of line? Here's Bill Lagatuda. In a small town in northern Arizona. Oh man, they locked me off. 47 year old accountant Catherine McCann. I'm going back on again. <laughs> is looking for love online. Looking for someone that values the meaning of a relationship, I am. With three marriages behind her. It's been a long time. I would like to have a companion in my life. Catherine's pinning her hopes for future romance on a mouse, a click, and a carrot. These are people that have said they're interested in me. They've sent me a carrot. What does okay? that mean? It just means I'm interested in you. Okay. Here's a carrot. The nice thing about the internet is that there's, you can meet people in places that you would never meet them before. Oh, come on. Now, after two years of searching the web, Catherine thinks she's finally met her match. I have someone who's approached me. We've exchanged several emails, and um, he wants to meet me. And here's Mike. Mike Young from Denver, Colorado, at six foot two inches tall. I gotta have somebody that's taller than me. <laughs> he appears to be everything Catherine is looking for. And then we have this astrological match that says he's 51% compatible with me. And Mike seems to agree. After just six weeks of emails and phone calls. He's actually bought me tickets so that I can go meet him. A weekend rendezvous in Los Angeles. It's kind of a spur of the moment thing. I like spontaneity. That's cool with me. What is it about Mike that intrigued you? He fit a lot of the parameters I'm looking for. He was looking for a relationship just like I'm looking for a relationship. I am downloading this site. But in cyberspace, looks, along with just about everything else, can be deceiving. How do you know that you're being told the truth? I don't. I love the name of this site. Who is he dot com. So before Catherine goes anywhere, I would like to order some profile. She's putting her cyber suitor through a background search. I've had men tell me they're not married. And I do a background search prior to meeting them, and lo and behold, they've got a wife. And when you find that out, what do you do? I confront them with it. And what do they say? Uh, usually they hang up. <laughs> so Catherine has turned to this woman for help. Hi, this is Linda. Attorney Linda Alexander runs whoishe.com, whoishe.com. Online, anybody can be behind a screen, anything they want to be. Okay. For a fee of um, up to $75, she'll search through public records you want to do a comprehensive check. for anyone seeking the truth about their online companion. I find that 60% of the time, people will have found that somebody has lied about something. 60% of the 60 time? 60% of the time, people are not telling the truth. Men are more likely to lie about what? Marital status. And women are more likely to lie about they what? They first lie about what their, what their age is. What is it about internet relationships that, that, that fool people? Once again, you don't have the same opportunity to see the person or to talk to the person directly. And if you're an honest person, you think that other people are equally as honest. Catherine may be honest, but she's not taking any chances. The report is ready. What kind of red flags are you looking for? I'm looking for whether or not he's lying to me. So just who is the man behind the profile? This is Mike Young. I'm a risk taker. I try to get away to do something different. Mike races sidecar motorcycles. He designs websites and enjoys dating online. Looking for a woman who can challenge me. I am pretty straightforward and direct. I have a high sex drive and know how to please. 
But I think it's important you need to say those things. How many women have you met after contacting them online? I, I think maybe half a dozen. And Mike's the kind of guy who can't imagine why anyone 13 phone numbers found. would want to check up on him. Would you ever check up on anybody that you met? I think it's an invasion of privacy, frankly. I haven't even considered doing that. This goes back to 1975. I thought you could only go back seven years. All your private information, your credit cards, are all on the Internet. And, and you, you read stories every day about people abusing that. Boy, there's a lot of information here. It's kind of spooky what people can find out about you. I'm a very private person. I want to control that as much as I can, and it's very difficult. Metal firearms and explosives. Well, he, maybe he doesn't carry a gun. That's kind of cool. <laughs> There don't seem to be any glaring red flags in Mike's background check. Yeah, I was a hell of a ride. And so, in all candor, I'm going to LA because I don't see anything that tells me not to. The date is set. Let's go up to gate C1, grab your boarding pass. They'll both fly to Los Angeles for a romantic weekend. Ladies and gentlemen, Southwest Airlines, please do not see your back with flight 999. Hi. Hi. How are you feeling? I'm shaking. How are you feeling? This is crazy. I know. She gave me a good first impression. She dressed well, which is a cue. Okay. So what time do you make the reservation? 6.30. So far, so good. It's a little risky, but I'm taking a little bit of the edge off of the risk by doing a background check. You got to take the risk or you don't reap the reward. Hey, Ms. Wadsworth. Beth Wadsworth of Vista, California, says she knows firsthand the risks of internet dating. Keep looking straight ahead. Just like Catherine, Beth met a man online. When you started getting the messages from him, what did you think? Oh, well, it's exciting. Told me he was a law student, lived at home. Thomas Abney of Newburgh, Oregon, seemed like a pretty nice guy. Just a nice guy, someone that I could probably get to know, maybe meet someday. And that's what happened. After just two months of emails and phone calls. He called and said, I'm at the airport. It was kind of exciting. I was like, wow, we know we're going to meet, you know, for the first time. What happened in the, in the first few days that you were together? Did you have a good time? Yes. We got along. We went out to dinner and shopping and sat and talked and watched TV. And but after several days, Beth says Abney's visit was conflicting with her workload, so she asked him to cut his visit short. And he said, fine. So we were hugging goodbye, and he just threw me down on the bed and jumped on top of me and started strangling me. Beth fell unconscious, and when she awoke, Abney was still there. He took a, a claw hammer and hit me three times in the head. Abney finally left the house, Communication enabling her to call 911. I hope you tried to kill me. Who did? Who bled now we're going to bring you up quickly. After nearly two years of physical therapy, Beth is now feeling much better. No dizziness. It could have killed her, so overall she's very fortunate to have ended up so well. As for Abney... Good morning, Mr. Abney. He was convicted last year of attempted murder and is serving life in prison. I felt really stupid for letting this happen because, you know, I'm smarter than this, but the whole Internet and meeting people that way, it was intriguing. Up next... We ran a background check on Thomas Abney. And what'd you find? Could that have kept Beth safe? And will Catherine's investigation into Mike's past lead to trouble? That's a red flag when somebody's afraid to expose who they are. Noon. <laughs> For Catherine and Mike, their big weekend in Los Angeles is off to a great start. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's a date that never would have happened unless Catherine ran a background check on Mike and found nothing alarming in him. I definitely would never meet anybody without a background check. It's a safety net. Thanks. But by Sunday morning, this is Southwest All right, we're at gate three. Go. The thrill is gone. Next one. Catherine is heading home early. How would you rate the date on a scale of one to ten? A <laughs> three, maybe. It was really pretty bad. <laughs> the whole idea, from my standpoint, is to try to make the weekend go okay no matter what. And this one got out of control, frankly. <laughs> what a pain that is. What sent this budding romance into a tailspin? It all started with an argument over the background check. I had told him that I wouldn't even meet him without it. You were so. absolutely clear about that? Absolutely clear about that. And now he says he didn't agree to... He forgot. 
she lied to me. I told her that uh, it was an invasion of my privacy, that I really didn't want to do that, and she, she agreed not to do it. But Mike says when Catherine arrived in L.A. She told me that, uh, that, I'd actually, that she'd actually run the background check. I was pretty disappointed, frankly, in the whole thing. Does it matter that the background check she ran on you turned up nothing that she found offensive? I, I have no idea what it turned up, and I don't care. There is nothing to, there's nothing to find out anyway. That isn't the point. It's my privacy. We had agreed not to do it. Excuse me. If you're going to have a relationship with somebody, your privacy is going to get invaded anyway. There's no future to this relationship? No, not with at you all. And Catherine? No. There's no future in this one at all? No, none. I'm going to go to the request of... But that won't change how Catherine prepares for her next encounter. I mean, what better protection could you have, especially as a woman? Yeah, I'm going to sit you up. Would a background check have saved Beth Wadsworth from being beaten by her cyber companion? We ran a check back seven years. And we, were we hired Linda Alexander to run a background check on Thomas Abney, and the answer is probably not. What did you find? Well, it appears that over the last 10 years, he's lived in several different cities. He was in the military. It appears that he was married. For someone capable of such a brutal crime, Abney's record showed no criminal convictions. In fact, there is definitely nothing in this report that would have suggested to her or anybody else that this man would have come in and violently attacked her. So is this still a good idea to do something like Absolutely. this? Absolutely. It just lent itself to asking questions. You know, why were you here? What were you doing? What were these things in your life? There's risks, there's dangers. I know that I'm never going to meet anybody without a background check. It's like, gee, I'm glad I did that. I feel safer on the date. Still ahead, detectives Watson and Harmony get another shot. We call this Operation United. At this online predator. His life will change today. The sting. Not, not the way that he planned. Next. Four weeks after being stood up by a man they believe to be an online sexual predator, investigators Jamie Watson and Mike Harmony are hitting the road. 87-1. Albany. The suspected pedophile, Timothy Farnham from Albany, New York, has re-established contact. He's also sent a one-way airline ticket to what he thinks is his 13-year-old online girlfriend in Bedford County, Virginia. The takedown will probably happen sometime mid late afternoon. They plan to be at Farnham's hometown airport when he arrives to meet the flight, less than 18 hours from now. It, it's well worth driving 10, 12 hours. After 11 hours of driving through four states, the Blue Ridge Thunder Task Force finally pulls into Albany and the headquarters of the New York State Police. What's the game plan for today? Uh, right now, we've got to go in and meet with the task force from up here, put our heads together, because really the ball's in their court now. This is their operation at this point. We're in their jurisdiction. We, we've got to meet with them and come up with a game plan. We call this uh, Operation United. The game plan is to combine forces. We've got potentially a pedophile who's got a range from uh, Virginia to Albany, New York. All travelers. Members of both teams will take up positions around the arrival gate at the airport before Farnham arrives. This guy has no idea that he's the subject of a, cr a criminal investigation. His first clue will be when we actually lay hands on him and say, come with us. I have your attention, please. His life will change today. Not, not the way that he planned. At the airport, no one except the undercover officers knows what is about to happen. The plane touches down. Minutes later, Farnham is spotted walking towards the gate. This time, it looks like he's the one who's been stood up. In seconds, he is surrounded and taken into custody. It was great. Everything finally just, I mean, it all came together to see the guys, they, the way they maneuvered in on him and the look on his face. <laughs> it was just great. Farnham has no idea that the young girl he has come here to pick up is really Officer Jamie Watson, standing just a few feet away. Was he shocked? Stunned. Yeah, that's a good word to describe it. <laughs> um, very surprised. Watson and Harmony say that Timothy Farnham is just one of thousands of adults 
looking to meet children on the internet every day. We know that we're not even making a dent in what's out there. You know, we're, we're two guys in a, in a small town in Virginia. But they will continue to put themselves on the line, one predator at a time. If we can make sure that one child doesn't get abducted or travel to meet someone, um, we, we've accomplished our purpose. Timothy Farnham may have thought he was about to begin a new romance. Police found this rose in his car. Since we first aired this story last year, Farnham pleaded guilty to a felony, attempting to disseminate indecent material to a minor, and is now serving a year in jail. The burden of protecting yourself and your children online still exists mostly with you. Using software that can block access to inappropriate chat rooms is a good place to start. Try to teach kids to halt all online communication whenever they come across material that's disturbing to them. You should report any online threats to your internet service provider. And parents, you should go online with your children to learn where they go and how to get there. As with any encounter with a stranger, caution and skepticism are your best allies to stop a cyber stalker. That's 48 Hours for tonight. Experience you can trust. CBS News.